Hello, hello, everybody. Hi. So I wanted to go live today because yesterday we had a guest, Gianna, on, and we had some questions about how to get started homeschooling. So there is a post, if you go to cleverlychanging.com, it kind of provides a recap of what we talked about as well as just different things that I wanted to add to the conversation. There are additional podcast links because we do have a podcast where a lot of these conversations we've already talked about a little bit more in depth. But every day for until August 6th, we are actually going live for a brief 30 minute conversation on how we homeschool and how we make it work. So yesterday, uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about how to work as well as teach your kids. And that's something that we really wanted to get into. How do I run my business and also teach my kids at the same time? So we're gonna get into kind of that practical knowledge so that people can understand how it's possible to actually make it work. So, um, let me just quickly introduce myself. I am L. Cole from the blog cleverlychanging.com. I am also one of the podcast hosts of the Cleverly Changing podcast, which is a podcast by two Black moms who homeschool, but it's not just for homeschoolers. The podcast also talks about um, different things where our kids, you get a chance to listen to our kids and you get a chance to hear a word of the day, usually a word from an African language, and sometimes we include some African facts or a proverb as well. And so the podcast is really for any family who wants to supplement their child's education. So these conversations that we're having live is an extension of the podcast. I personally have been homeschooling my kids for six years. I have twin girls. They are 11 years old and this is a new year. I actually was thinking about putting my kids in school when they reached middle school years. And, you know, we all know what happened with COVID. So last year, my kids went to a co-op and they were going three days a week. And I thought, oh, this is great. It'll be a great transition period to put them in a regular traditional school, but it turns out that, of course, that's not the case. And so just like everyone else has to pivot, I also have to find um, new ways of kind of making it fun and reinventing our homeschool because what we did for them in elementary school, they're a lot different now. They're older, their personalities are different. And so that means that I have to revamp what I did before to adjust to my kids. So this is also going to be um, a different experience and a different year for us. So um, I want you to know, I'm sharing that because I want you to know you're not alone in that journey. So what I am excited about I am very happy that I have had those previous years to really get to know my kids and get to know how they learn best so that I can teach them. And so what, um, what I really wanted to do, what I really wanted to do was have this conversation with you guys and let you ask questions and you know, just have an open forum so that we can talk about how families really make it work. So like many of you, um, if you don't know who I am, I, um, I am a mom of a child who has type one diabetes and also sickle cell anemia. And so because of her health conditions, I actually decided to homeschool her. Um, our pediatrician actually made the suggestion when before my kids were school age, she said it would be helpful if you homeschooled your children because school systems are very germy. And if you wanna keep your child as healthy as possible, then 
you know, you may want to think and consider homeschooling them. So that is really how I started my homeschool journey. So what I wanted to do today was let you know, what I wanted to do today was let you know how we make it work as a family. And for the most part, when I first started homeschooling them, when they were little in kindergarten and first grade, I was working at a more traditional job. Oh, hi. Hi, Isabel. Thank you for joining us. So if you are listening to this conversation, let me know that you have joined the conversation by leaving a comment. Let me know where you're from or just say hi. Let me know that you're here because sometimes we can't always tell when people are able to view the live. So definitely let me know that you're here and you're watching. So what I wanted to do, I just kind of wanted to tell you guys how I started and what worked for us. Early on, when my kids first started in kindergarten and first grade, we used a system called Classical Conversations. I know many of you have heard about Classical Conversations in the past, and it's not necessarily a curriculum. It is really like a foundational guide to give your kids a lot of information while they are young. And so it basically shares their so a lot of facts that they're not necessarily acting on. They're really just using those early years to add knowledge to their memory so that it'll be in their long-term memory and when they need to retrieve it, they can. So we actually stopped doing that after the three cycles. So the way conversation, classical conversations work is there are three different cycles cycle one, cycle two, and cycle three, and they cover different information. By cycle three, I begin to kind of um, get other additional supplemental work and use other curriculums to really give them a more well-rounded education. And so that's kind of what we did. Hi, so we have some other people joining us. We have Olivia from Mississippi. We have Gianna from Alabama. Thank you. Thank you for joining. So Yes, so that's what I did starting out. And here's the thing, when my kids learned how to read, I know if you guys have younger kids, my kids actually learned how to read uh, before they were school age. So with one of my daughters, I, when I was pregnant, I saw the infomercials for Your Baby Can Read and I used them. And honestly, they did work for my kids. They were able to read by the time they were two and three years old, for um, one of my daughters, though, I did have to su supplement that information. One just picked it up. She was reading from a very early age at two, and she could read. So the other one, I did have to use phonics and sound out the words. But I always was reading to them because I love children's books, and I love stories, and I love being animated, and I love acting them out. So reading time was a very fun time in my household. And so my kids would see their parents reading. They started reading early. So reading wasn't necessarily something that was a challenge for us. So when my kids actually started school, they already knew all their alphabets. And so it was kind of different. So if you're looking for information on how to teach your kids to read, for the most part, a lot of people, what I hear from other people is that they're using um, reading without tears or no, that's writing without tears, but they're using other um, different books like Bob books and things like that. That wasn't something that I necessarily had to do when my kids were little, very little. They were reading things like boxcar children, like the classics that I enjoyed as a little kid. They were reading them at an early age. And so um, that wasn't necessarily my experience. So when you meet different homeschoolers, they will have different experiences. Now, I will say, although my kids were reading early, they hated writing. So handwriting stuff was not something that they enjoyed. They, they prefer to type things out. So we would use like typing.com and I figured, hey, it was okay for them to just type out information. But it turns out <laughs> when I went to my first homeschool review with the super superintendent, um, with someone from the school 
public school systems office, they were like, no, your kids have to, you know, do the worksheets because you need proof of their education and that you're showing them regular instructions. So I had to really just buckle down and get my kids to do handwriting. And so for us, the hardest thing that I've had to teach my kids is handwriting. <laughs> and that is going to be kind of strange, I know, for a lot of you. But for me, that has been my experience. Now one of them, she's pretty great with handwriting. The other one, she still doesn't like to write. And um, my husband doesn't like to write. So, hey, that sometimes is life. So hi, thanks for joining us, Jessica. So today I'm just kind of sharing about my early experience homeschooling, and I'm also gonna get in how I actually work as well as take care of, um, take care and teach my kids at the same time. So my husband, he, um, before COVID, he worked outside of the home, um, a regular nine to five job. So that meant that I had my kids most of the day, pretty much all day all by myself. And so that meant that we really had to make their education experience fun. So we did a lot of stuff outside. Uh, when it came to learning their colors, when they were really little, and this was really prior to school age, I would use like vegetables. When we would go to the grocery store, I made it like a field trip. And I would talk about the different colors of vegetables and the different colors of fruits. And we would just go throughout the store <laughs> and that's how I taught my kids. And we would talk about the different words. Obviously we were in the grocery store a long time, but I was a mom of twins and I wanted to go somewhere and not be at home all day. So um, implementing field trips early on was something that I tried to do and I tried to incorporate learning so that it was very fluid when they were very little. So when they were at that age, I didn't necessarily use a curriculum. Um, like I said, we did do Costco conversations, but it was more memory work and we would um, have activities and go over that. And so that was really kind of how they set the foundation of their knowledge. As they got older, though, I had to implement some sy systems in place to make it work so that I could get work, I could get my work done, and they could be doing their work as well. And so when you have kids that are very young, so I'm talking like first, second, and third grade, you can't just say, some kids, you're not just going to leave some worksheets and say, do these worksheets. For the most part, I would have to set up my workstation very close to them and I would try to get my work done early in the morning before they got up. So I'm a morning person, so I prefer to get up extra early to get the work done. Now, if you're a night person, you probably want to stay up at night. I am not a night person at all all. I like go to sleep before my kids go to sleep. And it was funny because they would actually, I mentioned that they could read, so they would read me their bedtime stories and I would usually fall asleep in their room. <laughs> so, um, you know, to, to each his own. So you have to find a system that works for you. Nighttime getting work done usually didn't work out for me. Now, there were times like when there was a conference or something that we were working on and I had to get it done, I would have to stay up late and do it. So I was working for a nonprofit when my kids were really little and I would have to get that work done. And so I had to also set boundaries with um, the people I worked with so that I didn't feel overextended all day. At first, I didn't realize that I needed to set those boundaries and I was overextended and I was stressed. And, you know, if you're a person who has a personality where you're a perfectionist, I was like, oh my gosh, this isn't how I like to get things done because I was trying to, you know, take care of my twins as well as get my work done. And so quickly I had to learn how to set boundaries. And I also had to learn how to be more vocal about what I needed from my husband, what I needed from people people who said they were willing to help, <laughs> what I needed from myself, what my personal expectations were, and what I wanted to give to my job. So I had to be very clear on what job 
you know, what, what does success for me look like? And so for, for many of you, that could be simply writing down, you know, the pros and cons, what you need. For me, I'm a writer, so I, I like to write things down. And I also had to have a to-do list every single day. So I had to write down the task that really had to get done. And I had to set a time frame. So I would put on my timer and I would say, this has to get done in this particular amount of time. And I would do that. And when my kids woke up, I would try to um, help them and get them ready. Now, I will say, um, for me, early on, I let my husband know that I didn't feel like I could be superwoman and I needed his help. So before he went to work, often he would help, you know, like get them dressed or um, maybe give them breakfast. It was something so that it didn't feel like everything was all on me. And so that was really, um, I had to be clear and I had to be honest about what I needed. Um, and I will also say, when I initially started, I wasn't implementing self-care like I, I should have. <laughs> and so now, six years later, I have made sure that in my schedule and on my to-do list, I put some things that are important to me, that are for me, um, that are kind of quiet times. I'm an introvert and I need to take some quiet time just to myself where when I don't hear my little people saying, mommy, mommy, get this. Um, and it was funny because when my kids were very little and um, my me time was like taking a bath, they would sit outside the bathroom door and put their fingers under the door and dad would be home. And I was like, go ask your dad, you know, spend time with him. But um, early on, I had to learn how to implement that self-care. So I'm sharing that with you because when you start to take on the responsibility of working inside the home, as well as teaching your kids from home, being a wife, cleaning up the house, just so many things, it does start to pile up. And I'm not going to tell you that it's just been smooth sailing all along because it hasn't. And so I'm here to share what has worked and what hasn't worked so that you all won't make the same mistakes that I made. And, you know, we all have to grow. And so for me, it was really a process of growth where I begin to learn more about myself and my own personal needs. So thank you, Nicole, for joining us. It's so great to have you. Thank you, Alicia. I think your name is Alicia. So thanks for, um, for joining us. But I also want to tell you guys, you got to you got to make a list, a to-do list. So for me, I now put my reminders in my phone because I need to have alerts. So I've really gone digital with my to-do list because I do have so many things that I do. So I have a blog where I really need to be writing regularly on it. I try to freelance because as an entrepreneur, you have to have multiple streams of income. I have a podcast that um, airs bi-weekly. And at the time when my kids were little, when they were four and five, I was the children's ministry leader at our church. And that was so difficult to um, take care of my kids, be a wife, help out with the ministry. And I felt like I really just tried to do it all at that time. And in some ways I was doing too much without setting those boundaries. And so I had to learn how to say no sometimes, and I had to learn how to delegate. So our husbands, our spouse, our families can help us out. And it's nothing wrong with saying that you need help, but in order for other people to help you, you have to you have to have a system in place. So yesterday we talked about having objectives for your school, your school day, and for your school year. So I um, I wrote a post on cleverlychanging.com, and in that post it talks about a routine, and I share a um, 
a worksheet that you can download on what I do now. I actually do, I have a whole sheet where I put down what my kids need to learn, what materials are needed. And I do all of that beforehand so I'm not scrambling at the last minute because I'm telling you right now, if you are trying to get things together at the last minute and teach your kids like, oh, they need to know this. So I'm just going to do it. Um, you know, if you're trying to do it day by day, that's going to be a lot harder. So by putting systems in place first, you're going to do, you're going to relieve some of that stress. And you're going to also help your kids learn to see organization at work. So setting up those processes are important. And I'm going to show you two processes today that I use. So I'm going to show you right now. This is, oh, so this is a file folder. I don't know if you guys can see that, um, that great. Let's see. So this is the file folder. It's a file box and inside I actually have, so I'm gonna take out one of the file folders to show you. Um, and what I would do, this is a, a real folder that I had with my kids and inside it actually has their names and the date. So, so here's an example. Let's see if I can get this into the view. So this is, um, it says Layla uh, and it says Thursday. So what I have in here, I have every day um, a, a file folder for every day for both of my kids. And I started to do that. So there are actually more of those. And what I would do, I would put the worksheets inside the, inside the, um, the file folder. So I'm going to try to... Um, lift it up so that you guys can see it. So it's a hanging file folder. There are hanging files in there. And in each one, right now it's empty because we're not in, in our school year. But in each one, I would put out the worksheets and maybe um, it would have the objectives for that day. And I would organize it. And I would do it weekly if you can do it monthly, that's even better. But I used to do it weekly. Um, Sundays were my days to put the to make sure everything was in order. But I would I would print out like their worksheets, their crafts, and I would put all of the materials inside the file folder. And I'm telling you guys this because it made things so much easier. And also like there would be some times when I would have to leave home and my husband would, um, you know, stay home and help the kids. And he was able to help me because he knew what day was what. And I would say, hey, just go to, you know, if it was Tuesday, just go to Tuesday, see what's in Tuesday. And it would tell him how to help me. And so if you want people to be able to help you, you have to have a system in place. And I'm, I'm sharing that because it makes a huge difference. It really does. And um, in my state, we have a portfolio system where we have to keep a binder so that we show the state what our kids have been learning. So when I am able to take the papers that they've completed and grade them. So for me, I didn't have to do all the grading myself, thankfully. My husband would help me grade. Um, sometimes my mom would be here visiting us and she would help me grade. And my sister would also come and visit and help me grade papers. And um, what was great is I knew exactly where to go to get the papers that needed grading. And we were able to hole punch them and put them in the binder. And we were able, if I needed someone to kind of reinforce lessons. So in grading, if we saw there was an area that there was a deficit, sometimes they would say, hey, I wanna, I wanna you know, go over that with them. And so I used to get help. I didn't really do everything myself at all times. A lot of times I did. Some years I had to do things more on my own than others. But I will say if you can get a village, maybe it's a friend. So for me, my friend that has been uh, right there at my side, it has been Miriam, who um, if you watched yesterday, you would have met Miriam um, virtually. 
So Miriam is my co-host for my podcast, and we met in high school, actually. And it just turns out that we live in the same state. And um, she's one of my really close friends who she didn't even, she wasn't homeschooling her kids at first, but because of my experience homeschooling and you know some other things, she decided to homeschool her kids as well. And so now we're doing it together. And you know, if you can work with someone else, to kind of share some of the experience, it makes it better. We don't do um, we don't do any subjects the exact same. It's just having that support system and that camaraderie to talk about different things. To say, hey, so you know, my kid is struggling with this. Do you have any tips and things like that? It's great to have a person where you can bounce information off of. So that is one system that I have used in the past that was extremely helpful and it helped my kids become more self-sufficient. All right, so I have another system. So I don't know if you guys can see this that well, but I'm going to, let's see if I can take out one. Oh. So I don't think I can take them out, but what this is, this is one of those um, drawers that um, you pull out the drawer. And what I did um, right now, so when we start the school year, I'll probably use this system again, um, but it says Monday. So it's every day of the week. And then there's things for their electives. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are the full first um the first folders. And so this is what I use to put their books in. So, oh, that's awesome. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the comments in just a minute. But um, in this system, you can put your kids' books or you can put crafts. It's just great to have a place for them to go to know, these are my materials for Monday. These are my materials for Tuesday. And so I actually have two of these because um, I have two kids, but you don't have to, um, you don't have to have two. You could use the, the one for both of your kids. Um, you just have to find a system that works for you. And these are the systems that have really helped me streamline the process and make things easier for me. So I'm gonna go through the comments now. If you guys have questions about the system, um, in the system, you do look up, so you, um, on the worksheet, you look at the concepts that you're going to teach your kids, and then you would look up additional supplemental materials. And that's what you would put into here. So that is one of the ways that you get organized. So some of you are not going to have um, a homeschool room. And in these two systems, you don't necessarily have to have one dedicated homeschool room. Homeschool room. Um, if you have to use your... So early on, I used to use our um, dining room. And there was a large bookshelf in our dining room with all the books. And then, you know, we have these two systems. And so this is on wheels, so you can roll it around. It's not hideous to look at. So, you know, it can be in a discreet spot. And so this is just one of the ways that you can get organized, especially if you have, you don't have a lot of space. So if you have questions, definitely share the questions, but um, setting boundaries is one of the ways that I work from home. Getting up early or doing my work later is another way. And then there are, like when I implement brain breaks for my kids. So that means that they would do work for like 15 to 20 minutes and then we would have a break and the break would be for like 10 minutes. And in that 10 minute time, they could play, they could read, they could, you know, you want to give your kids their own spot to do something. And that's when I used to check emails, like if it was something that I could quickly respond to, that's what I would do. Also, um, I would also recommend like at lunchtime, maybe you can eat and work 
at the same time, that could be a time where, you know, if your kids are able to eat on their own, I know younger kids, you kind of need to sit there and maybe help them out. But older kids, um, you can definitely um, make help them make their lunch in the morning or they can make their own lunch just like they would at school so that during lunchtime, you really have that free time to maybe take a call if you need to or get some work done, maybe check emails and things like that. And that is how I've made it work. So I'm gonna go through these comments. Um, so let's see. Alicia says, it takes a village to help things run smoothly. Absolutely. And sometimes that village may not be in person. So I gotta be very honest with you. My first village, was actually people online, my friends that I would meet online who were also homeschooling. Because when I first started, there was no one in my immediate community that was also homeschooling that I knew. And so I would reach out to my friends online for support. And so it doesn't have to be somebody that's right there in your neighborhood. But now that it's a different time, there are probably going to be people right there in your neighborhood. Now, when I first started, schools were open. So it wasn't so um, it wasn't like it is now. So now that village hopefully will be even greater than it was when I first started. All right. So um, Gianna says, oh, self-care. Yes. Self-care is important. It's not really optional, everybody. We really have to take care of ourselves or we're going to get burned out. And so you have to understand you, as you're going through this whole homeschooling experience, take note of what your needs are. Like, do you need a break? Most likely, yes. That's why I implement brain breaks for my kids because I also need a break. You know, that could mean, you know, you're getting a glass of water and water really helps to refresh you and just give you added energy. So you wanna start implementing some really healthy practices. For us, it could be like a healthy snack because that's gonna help um, get your day going. So Isabel says, oh yes. Nicole says, love it. And she says, amen. All right. So um, Gianna says we need to set aside time to recharge as mommies. Yes. Jessica says so true. Isabel says you're amazing. Hey, I'm a work in progress, but, but I want to be able to share my experiences with everybody. Gianna says in order to have other people help us, we need to have systems in place. Yes, because otherwise we don't know what to delegate. And for many of us, especially those of us who have multiple interests in other things and multiple, you know, things that you do in your career, if you need to hire a nanny or somebody to come into your house to help you do that, you know, no one says that it has to look a certain way. If you can afford to hire somebody to come in and tutor your kids, do that. You know, you, the whole point is to give your kids what they need so that you're giving them the attention that, that they need. Or if you don't necessarily want to hire somebody, you know, partner with somebody that you trust who's another family, maybe in your neighborhood, in your community, in your circle of friends, and maybe do things on different days. I will say that um, now that my kids are older, we don't do all seven subjects in the same day. So just like when you were in middle school or high school, there were, you know, you had a math day, um, you know, and you did maybe three subjects a day and they would rotate throughout the week. That's how we do it now. And it just makes it better to um, get things done. Now, if you're partnering with someone and they're better at math, and you make it a certain day, then maybe you guys can get together on that particular day. But it is form a system. And if you have that schedule in place beforehand, you can coordinate with someone else to see how you guys can collaborate. And if you are working, collaborating with someone else can help relieve some of that stress. So Alicia says, being organized is a great habit for children to learn and practice. Yes. And so the things that we want them to take on, we have to model. So 
I haven't always been organized, but what I have learned is when I am organized, my children learn better, I learn better, I'm less stressed, they're less stressed, and our homeschool works better and runs more smoothly. So Isabel says, you're the ultimate organizer. Hey, it has taken a whole lot of <laughs> trial and error to get here. And I've had some painful, painful times. And so what you learn is, you have to learn from your mistakes. And for me, that's how these systems were born, from my mistakes. Gianna says, I asked my mom if my kids can practice reading to her on FaceTime. Oh, I asked my mom if my kids can practice reading to her on FaceTime twice a week when school starts and she happily obliged. We don't have to do it all day by ourselves. I love that because you two are in different areas and you found a way to help and i think with technology it is so much easier to get other people involved with this schooling thing and i know your mom was an educator and so i think that's an excellent idea something that we all can take into um into our own homeschooling lives because i know my mom she misses us and I know that, you know, FaceTiming with the kids makes her day. And so it's, you know, we can't necessarily physically be together right now, but we can FaceTime. And so I love that idea. So it says, while well, great tip, I need organization tips. Um, Isabel says, what do you think about scheduled homeschool curriculums? So I, I think, I don't know, are you saying like, um, when you say scheduled, the ones that are virtual online? I'm not sure. If you could um, kind of give some more information about that, that would be great. Um, I know that there are co-ops, some virtual co-ops, and I think that's fine. I think you have to, um, you know, try them out and see if they work. I know this year we are gonna put our kids into some virtual co-ops. Last year they were at a physical co-op, but this year um, we're gonna do some virtual ones. And so we're gonna see how that works and we're gonna give it a try. This summer they took some virtual classes and they really liked it. And I've had them do tutoring in the past that was virtual and they liked that as well. So where did you get your rolling card? I actually got mine from Michael's. Um, they always have a coupon for 50 or 40% off. So I used the coupon and I got it from there. But I have also seen them at Aldi <laughs> and I've seen them um, at other places. So just shop around and see where it's um, most inexpensive. Um, but you shouldn't really be paying more than $19.99. If, if you see it more than that, you can get it for cheaper than that. Um, Alicia says, so true. Um, Isabel says, how much time do you set aside in the morning to do your work before school starts? So um, when they were really little, when I was working for the nonprofit, I used to have to get up at around um, five, um, four and five to get my work done because I would try to get done as much as I could so that the rest of the day, all I had to do was stop in and check emails. Now I get up around six. Um, I'm, I naturally wake up early. So that's how my personal body rhythms work. Um, I get up around six and um, I, I start school around 10. So that gives me like four hours to get work done. Um, and then at 10, that's when we have breakfast and devotion and things like that. So um, taking notes, brain breaks, yes taking a break and they do that in schools too so that's something that we can implement from um, regular schools into our homes so isabel said i love that idea and um isabel says sunlight has a schedule to follow each day oh okay great so i think that if i think it depends on personalities i love that um, so if you're like a type A person, I think that very strict schedule is great because you don't have to wing it or create it for yourself. And so I would say, try it out. Um, I didn't, I didn't start out like that, but it is something that now that my kids are older and I think for the older ones, um, and even the younger ones, they kind of need to know what's going to happen next. So if you 
if they have a schedule that helps set the objectives that I talked about for you. So it kind of um, makes it easier on you versus when you have to, you know, set that schedule yourself. So it sounds like it would be a great experience. I haven't necessarily used sunlight like myself, but I have heard great things from other homeschoolers who have used it. And so I think if you are a person who is comfortable following a strict schedule, go for it. Um, and also, for those of you who aren't type A people and you like flexibility, I would say, you know, you can embrace that, but kids need to know what's going to come next. So even though you may not be embracing it strictly, you do need to kind of um, be clear with your kids what's going to happen. Because what happens is they're going to start acting like, oh my gosh, I'm bored. I don't know what to do. They may start whining because they need attention. And so in the, for those early years, you want to kind of have a schedule so that they know, so that their body gets used to a certain rhythm. All right, guys, I know we've been on this live for 40 minutes, but I hope this has been helpful. And um, we will be on tomorrow at three again. Um, but I wanted to kind of give you a breakdown on what has worked for me, how the experience has worked for me throughout these years. And I wanted to be candid and let you guys know. Again, I would love for you to listen to my podcast, the Cleverly Changing Podcast. And it is on most platforms. So you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, subscribe, give me a review, let me know that you like it, share it with a friend. And that's one of the ways that you can support. So um, I'm trying to make myself available because I know this is a scary time for many of you, but it doesn't have to be. Parents just like me have navigated these uncharted waters before and we are surviving. We're not only surviving, we're thriving. And so whatever information that I can give to you guys to make it easier, that's what I'm doing. If um, any of you would like to support or share the um, podcast with someone, um, please do let other people know about it so that um, so that my channels will you know grow and I can continue to support my family through my entrepreneurship. So I thank you. Thanks everybody for joining and I wish you guys the best. All right. And if you have questions, feel free to continue to leave questions on this live. And if you're watching the replay, let me know by just putting in the comment section replay. All right, bye now.